Hello everyone and welcome back. We are beginning season six and the focus of season six is on something called a differential equation. We are going to define differential equations in this season and then we are going to talk a little bit about how the techniques of calculus two can be used to solve differential equations. Now, this is a very, very important topic, especially if you're going into engineering. Uh, differential equations occur incredibly often in dynamics. I also see them come up quite often in thermodynamics and in circuits. Additionally, there is an entire math class coming, which is all about differential equations, what we call um, at this college Math 238. And so if you uh, internalize and remember what we're talking about today, uh, then it will give you a huge advantage in those engineering and math classes to come. So a differential equation, when someone is talking about a differential equation, all they're talking about is an equation that contains a derivative. That's all. So to give you some examples of differential equations, um, one of the most simple examples of a differential equation is something like the following. I'm saying, I'm thinking of a function y whose derivative is equal to 3x plus 1. This would be an example of a differential equation because it is an equation containing a derivative. In this case, the derivative of y with respect to x. I could also say I'm thinking of a function y whose derivative is equal to itself. This would also be an example of a differential equation because this equation contains a derivative. I could also introduce second derivatives. I could say I'm thinking of a function y whose second derivative is equal to cosine of t plus 2. In this case, I'm looking for a function and I'm thinking for of a function y of t whose second derivative is equal to uh, cosine of t plus 2. Or you could say I'm thinking of a function whose second derivative is equal to four copies of the original function, or you could get even more complicated than that. I'm thinking of a function where if you take the second derivative and you combine it with two copies of the first derivative and you combine it with, um, let's say, three copies of the original function, that the result of all of that is zero and they all cancel each other out. These are all perfectly valid examples of what are called differential equations. And there is a very, very wide variety of such equations. Now, the reason why differential equations are studied is that differential equations often pop up naturally when you apply the laws of physics to uh, some common situations. So to give you an example, let's consider a scenario where I have an object whose position is represented by a function y of t. Y is giving me the position of an object at time t. Now, we remember from introductory physics and from Newton's laws of motion that if you have an object with a constant mass called m and you denote the acceleration of the object by a and if you denote the net force of the object by f, then there is a relationship that the net force f is equal to mass times acceleration, f equals ma. I claim that this law here from physics, one of these laws of motion, is actually a differential equation in disguise. And to recognize this as a differential equation, it's worth remembering that acceleration is just the second derivative of position with respect to time. So if I put that information into this equation, then I get that mass times the second derivative of position is equal to the net force. And behold, it's an equation containing a derivative, an equation containing a derivative, and therefore this is a differential equation that has popped up very naturally just from this uh, basic law of motion here. 
Now we can complicate this further in situations where we have specific information um, about what is happening with these net forces on the right side. To give you an example, suppose that I have an object which is attached to a spring. And I'm going to let y of t represent the position of this object at time t, with y equals 0 representing what is called equilibrium position. So if you're not familiar with this term equilibrium position, what this is referring to is you have your spring, and you hook your object onto it, and the weight of that object sort of stretches the spring out and displaces the spring downward. But if you let go of the object and let it hang out and rest for a while, uh, eventually that object will come to a standstill where it's sort of hanging um, for the spring at a standstill. And the position where the object sort of stops and hangs, this is what I'm calling y equals zero, which is equilibrium position. And then I am measuring all the other positions of this object relative to that. So for example, if I took this object and grabbed it and moved it upward, then I might be getting positive positions from that. And if I took this object and stretched it out and pulled it downward, then maybe I'm getting negative positions from that. All of that would be measured relative to equilibrium, which is here at y equals zero. Now, suppose that I do go in and take this object and push it upward. and I displace it to a location above equilibrium up here somewhere. Let's suppose, for example, that I have a positive y value. For example, I might have something like a position of 2. If you take an object on a spring and you compress that spring, by pushing the object up above equilibrium position, you're going to feel the spring resist that action, right? If you push the object up, then the spring is going to try and push the object back down. And the spring is going to try to push the object back into equilibrium position. So the spring exerts a force in the, in this case, downward direction, to try and restore the spring and bring it back to equilibrium position. Similarly, if I take the object on that spring and I pull it down to a location below equilibrium, suppose it's somewhere down here where y is negative, for example, I might be dealing with a y value of negative 3 units or something like that. If you pull the spring below equilibrium position and you stretch the spring out, then the spring will once again resist that action and it will exert a force upward to try to pull the object back up toward equilibrium position. So this phenomenon, when you're dealing with the spring, is sometimes called the spring's restoring force that is acting to push the object back into equilibrium. And we can see that the direction in which the force is exerted is always opposite to the position of the object. If you move the object upward, the restoring force will act downward and if you move the object downward, the restoring force will act upward. Not only that, but there is a relationship between the position and the strength or the magnitude of the force. Because if you really, really crunch that spring and you push the object way up there to the top, then the spring is going to act even harder and push even harder to restore that object to equilibrium. 
And likewise, if you pull the spring really far down and you stretch it out a great deal, and you push the object way below equilibrium, then the object is going to experience a large restoring force upward. So mathematically, what I would say is that the restoring force has a strength that is proportional to, proportional to the object's distance from the equilibrium. Because as the distance from equilibrium becomes larger, the restoring force also becomes larger. Now to capture that, Mathematically, we can use the proportion equation that says that the restoring force and the position y are related by restoring force is equal to a constant times y. If one quantity is equal to some constant times the other quantity, um, an equation like this captures the fact that the two quantities are in proportion. Because as the position um, gets larger and larger, then the restoring force will also get larger and larger. And as the position gets smaller and smaller, and if you're only a short distance away from equilibrium, the restoring force will also be smaller. In addition to that, I would apply a negative sign in this equation. And the negative sign is simply here to capture the fact that the position and the force are acting in opposite directions. If I move the object upward, the force is acting downward. If I move the object downward, the force is acting upward. So this equation right here, the restoring force is equal to a negative constant times the position. This equation right here is capturing this behavior that we see when we work with an object attached to a spring. Now that we have established what the restoring force looks like in terms of the object's position, let's go ahead and write down this situation of an object on a spring as a differential equation using the laws of motion and assuming that the only force acting on this object is this restoring force from the spring. If the restoring force of the spring is the same thing as negative constant times y, then and if that is the only force acting on the object, then this expression here is going to take the place of the net force in this equation of motion. So on the right-hand side of that equation, in place of the net force, I will have negative k times y. On the left-hand side of that equation, I will have a mass times acceleration. So we will have mass times the second derivative of the object's position. So this differential equation captures physically what is happening with an object attached to a spring that is moving around. If you take the mass times the object's acceleration, y double prime, then that will be equal to a negative constant times y, which is once again representing the object's position. So this differential equation captures physically what's happening when you have an object moving on a spring, and you're assuming no forces are acting on that object except the spring's restoring force. Now, once again, for practice, understanding how differential equations arise from physical situations, let me just go ahead and complicate this 
situation with the spring a little bit. In this situation, I want to assume that our object is a little bit bulky. So if I were to draw what I have in mind in this situation, I would have my spring and I would have my object attached to it, but this time perhaps the object attached to that spring is like a cardboard sheet. Now, if I pull this object down from equilibrium, let's say that this is y equals zero again, here's equilibrium position. And let's suppose that once again, I pull the object down from equilibrium to a position way down here. And then I release the object and I allow the spring's restoring force to pull it upward. Because this object is so bulky, as it moves, its movement will be affected by air resistance. And the air resistance will act in the opposite direction of the object's movement, and the uh, air resistance will um, act to sort of push the object backwards. So in this situation, if you're dealing with a bulky object, then as it's moving, it's being acted upon by two relatively strong forces. The restoring force of the spring acting to pull it back to equilibrium and the air resistance acting to resist the object's movement. Likewise, if I have that same object and I pull it um, above equilibrium and I compress the spring and I'm in a situation like this one, then the restoring force of the spring will act to push the object back down But as the bulky object is in movement through the air, the object will experience air resistance, which is trying to push the object back upward. So when I'm thinking about the net force acting on the object in this situation, I'm going to have to account for these two different forces. One of them is the restoring force, and one of them is the force of this air resistance. We already know that the restoring force is proportional to the object's position and it's acting in the opposite direction of the object's position. Let's see if I can write down a mathematical expression that expresses um, what the air resistance is doing in this situation. Now, when you're dealing with air resistance or drag, uh, we have already observed that air resistance will act in the opposite direction of how the object is moving. If the object is moving upward, air resistance will act downward. If the object is moving downward, air resistance will act upward. Not only that, but it has experimentally been found that if you are moving faster through the air, you're going to experience more air resistance. So in other words, the magnitude of the air resistance is once again, proportional to, proportional not to the object's position, but to the object's velocity slash speed. Magnitude of air resistance is proportional to the object's speed. So if I think about 
that statement as an equation We know that proportions in mathematics are represented by constant multiples. Air resistance is equal to a constant multiple times the object's speed. And the speed of an object, its velocity, can be found by taking the first derivative of position, y prime. So what I've written right down right here captures the proportion relationship between the air resistance and the object's speed. The only final modification that I'm going to make is I'm going to put another minus sign into this equation to capture the fact that air resistance always acts in the opposite direction of the object's movement. So if the velocity is positive and the object is moving upward, air resistance will be negative and act downward. And conversely, if the velocity is negative because the object is moving downward, then air resistance is doing the opposite thing and it's acting upward. So this minus sign helps to capture the fact that air resistance is always opposite the object's movement. Now that I've written down this expression for air resistance, I can go ahead and put that into our net force equation. If we have a bulky object on a spring, then the net force is the combination of the restoring force as well as the force of air resistance, which we now know is proportional to negative some constant times y prime beta here standing for a constant. So now we have an equation which starting from mass acceleration equals net force has become mass times y double prime is equal to the net force on this object negative k times y minus beta times y prime. This differential equation captures what is happening physically if you have a bulky object experiencing air resistance as it um, moves attached to a spring. This differential equation naturally arises from that situation. And this is the advantage of differential equations. They usually just sort of appear and pop up very naturally when you're um, examining a physical situation um, and applying the natural laws to that situation, uh, just as it did here. Today, um, our exercise set will mainly be focused on um, interpreting and understanding differential equations that come out of various physical situations. And then as we go into the next couple of episodes of the class, we are going to begin to talk about how to find the function y of t or the function y of x that makes a differential equation true. How, for example, from an equation like this, could you find the function that predicts the object's position at any given time? We will be talking about that in the next few episodes and you will learn a lot about that if you take the math class called Differential Equations.